Hey, Larry, thanks for coming on today, bro. Greatly appreciate you. Uh, no problem. Thanks for having me on. Dude, so let's just, uh, let's get into your story, man. Tell me about, like, family, how you grew up, mom, dad, siblings, that type of thing. Um, I grew up, well, I was born in the hospital in D.C., and I grew up in Maryland. So after my dad, uh, he got released from the Washington Redskins. Most people don't know this. He doesn't like to tell the story. But he was released from the Washington Redskins, and so he became a physical education teacher down at uh, Southern Maryland called Madonna High School. He was successful. He won two state championships before I was born. And when I was born, he won, I want to say, two or three more afterwards. Uh, we grew up, my brother and my sister, they're twins. They're two years younger than I am. We grew up all playing sports. We grew up, it was no summers that we spent chasing girls <laughs> or hanging out. We were playing sports. So my sister did softball and cheerleading. My brother did football with me. So we Basically, it was a sports all the way through high school and into college. My brother and I, my sister, we all played you know, college sports at Penn State. So it was, it was a blessing to, to keep us all together as a family. And we all played off one another. My brother was a receiver. So he blew, most of my uh, highlight runs in college, my brother's on the tail end of those. Um, and then my sister played softball. So it was, it was a great atmosphere. We, you know, we went to church every day. Uh, there wasn't times where we didn't. We didn't go to church, but we went to church every day and we're a close-knit family. If something happened with school, uh, as far as growing up and switching high schools, my dad had to intervene on because of me, because of, you know, once you're a coach's kid, you get a lot of favoritism. So my dad had to go in and set some coaches straight, set some teachers straight as well. So my dad always had my back because he understood that I always was taught to work hard, to go out there and put your best foot forward and don't leave anything on the field. Uh, so. You know, we grew up that way, and then, you know, we became, I became successful, you know, playing uh, NFL football for Kansas City Chiefs, and my dad right now, he's, he was a Penn State D-line coach, and now he's an Ohio State D-line coach, and successful there, already won a national championship ring, so we're pretty much, you know, a good family. Well, now, so let me ask you that you said about your dad having to go in and talk to coaches and teachers, was it a matter of they were being a little too soft on you and he wanted them, them to push you more. What was the, what was the story there? No, the story was they would single me out and they didn't like me getting favoritism. And at the time I was letting my talent play for me and I was becoming more exposed to media doing interviews. And once certain people saw that and they, and they linked it to my dad, they thought that, Oh, only reason why he's successful, only reason why they were mentioning him in, in the newspaper is because of his dad. So I had to deal a lot with being punished for my dad being successful. And I did this all the way when I was playing, you know, Pop Warner ball. When I, at the time, they would call it 75 pound ball. Uh, so I, a lot of coaches, my dad was already successful. So a lot of coaches who were community coaches would treat me bad because they didn't want to make everybody think that I was being given everything. So I had to work twice as hard at everything I did. And my dad sometimes, he knew it was, it was going to be unfair and he prepared me for that. Oh, wow. So did, as far as your dad and I, dude, I get, I get that. <laughs> it's like your dad's pretty well known in the community and, and probably in nation. And so kind of living under that, that almost that shadow was there, did you feel any pressure as a young man, uh, uh, you know, football player? to live up to a certain benchmark or was your dad, did he, did he help you handle that pretty well? Oh, uh, I, I, it was, it was tough. It was tough. It was times I wanted to quit because I didn't know about contact football. So it would be times where I would shy away from contact or I, I would get popped really hard and didn't want to go back in the game. So for my dad being who he was as a co already a successful high school coach, I had to be tough. I had to show, Everybody that I wasn't just, you know, put on a team because I was a coach's kid or I wasn't taken care of because I was a coach's kid. I had to fight twice as hard. And I think growing up that way, it overly, I had to overly develop um, an aggression. So I had to be overly aggressive. I fought at times I didn't want to fight, but I just fought because I did, I had to set a precedent that I wasn't just a soft coach's kid. I had to go out and fight. And I think through my life, I, it adapted my personality to where it hurt me in certain areas of my life. But on the football field, it made me a force to be reckoned with. People respected me more because I was overly aggressive. 
And in those days, it doesn't have the rules as they do it now in football. But as those days, the harder you hit somebody, the more you get the sticker on your helmet. And that's how we lived. Yeah, and that aggressiveness, and I see it in, you know, a lot of the guys even that we've interviewed, it's that trying to balance. And you were young too, right? And we'll talk about that maybe in just a bit. But that, uh, that aggressive behavior on the field and how somehow you dial that down when you're off the field. And I'm sure it gets, it's also one of those things, it's an ego. You get so caught up in the hype and the spotlights on you all the time. You can't do, I mean, you do anything little bitty wrong and it's like, man, they're just on you like a mob. And, and so trying to balance that, man, going out there and, and just working your tail off on the field and being aggressive and doing all that, but yet off the field, having to dial that back, it's a little tricky, I guess, huh? It was very tricky. And, and truth be told, uh, I was a better artist than I was a football player. And my mom, she would bring cartoon crayons, history books, and I would copy and draw and show her all my work. I would draw my father, I would draw my mother, I would draw, like, I, would, I was more of an artist than I was a football player. And so she knew if I was somewhere quiet, I was drawing. And I think when it came to football practice, my dad said, hey, you got to go out there, you got to be tough, you got to do this. So it was a, a difficult balance to, to be quiet in your normal nature and then turn around and be a ferocious monster for one nature and for two hours and then come back off the field and be like, okay, be that quiet kid again. I think when I grew up, it kind of, it, oh, it, it was imbalanced because I was more playing football than I was being a normal human being. So I was always on the football field, summer camps, hitting all the time so my personality definitely changed from that point on now tell me how did your dad influence your life as a as a young man and, and even now i mean as you've grown older through college and through the nfl how did your dad really kind of guide you and help you navigate those waters uh he, he did it really well he was being a successful high school coach he already knew how to manage everything else like he knew where i needed to be and he knew the certain players that he coached were great men and he got them to that point and these some of these kids didn't have fathers so my dad became a father to a lot of these high school players so he knew how to get me prepared for the outside world so he got me prepared by doing sports and made sure i was accountable for everything i done making sure i was prepared and he told me if you want to do a sport or anything you want in your life you have to know the history of everything so my father broke down all the history of NFL greats. And that at that point on, I looked at my father as Mufasa. You know, I, mean, I looked at my dad like, I didn't have any, I wanted to be like this person, that person. I, it was my dad who was the first person at the gate that that's who I idolized. And then after that, it was Jim Brown, Walter Payton. And even as a nine-year-old kid, I really didn't watch the football that I was in, like Emmitt Smith, uh, Doug Williams, those, those guys at that, at that time. But I was... Bronco Nagurski, Larry Zonka. I was to the old school players. And that's what my dad got me prepared for. He got me to accept and love the, the past so I knew what the future was going to be. And I, I take it that he really helped establish a mental toughness in you that, that maybe a lot of other guys didn't have. But it's because he was a coach, knew how things were going to be, and probably knew what was coming for you in college and in, in the NFL – he was able to really prepare you for that mentally. Because I, I had imagined mentally just that mind game alone and having to deal with all that chaos is pretty crazy, right? It's very, it's very crazy. And plus you get into a lot of coaches who have egos who, you know, they're not – I'm not their kid. I'm not their son. So they don't have any loyalty to me. And I always saw from my dad how he treated his players. And being around high school football players, he's, I see how my dad treat other players. It wasn't – he was just giving things to guys because, you know, they were glamour or they were, you know, one's better than the other. My dad literally set his, his quality level as who is going to work the hardest. And that's who he, he put up front. That's who he made starters. So my train, train of thought was, all right, all I got to do is prepare and be the best on the field. And if my talent overworks somebody else, I should get the role. And that's how my father prepared me for that. And that's why when I always had these little, you know, spits and spat with coaches is because no one was like my dad being a coach. My dad was always honest. He never lied to players. And he never did anything out of selfish reasons. So it was, it was kind of hard dealing with other coaches outside my dad because I had my dad on a, a very high pedestal when it comes to uh, coaching. 
Dude, I love that, man. You know, I think we talked a little bit beforehand. There's so many stories out there of fathers. I can get all the stories of the dads who weren't the best example, but it's tough to find those stories like you have with your dad. And to that point, give me one or two stories, man. What what were some of the most memorable moments, moments with your father? Was it on the field or related to football or was it off? I think it was... I think when my dad really starts seeing me come full circle as far as really being a running back, and it, I, I could I could say that once I it was a film. We when my mom used to watch me, watch the, used to film me playing football, and she could never hold the camera. She would always shake it, and so my dad was like, "Give it to me." And then my dad would watch, and you could hear when I would watch my tapes of me when I be nine to ten years old. My dad would be amazed at how I was breaking tackles. And you would hear it on the beat. It's like, oh, my Jesus. Oh, oh. And you could hear. My dad's not like a really overly emotional guy when he's watching things. But when you, when I, my dad was here, when I was hearing my own father be amazed at the fact that his son is breaking tackles and, and playing above his potential, it really made me feel good. And so when my dad would be and I would be really close, he became my coach in most of these times when I was young. So it would be like after games, hey, I think you did great. You know, you did amazing. I'm proud of you. And then it was when I came to Penn State and I ran, when I broke the 2,000-yard barrier, my dad, it's on film. I can show people the film, but he hugged me, and it was a very long hug. And at the same time, he said, in my ear, I'm proud of you. I love you. You did everything right. You did everything you're supposed to do. You stay tough. You stay with it. I'm proud of you. And that's the only time my dad's ever said that to me on the football field when I broke the – you know, the record because he's, you know, we're both in, he's defense, I'm offense. So it was, it was amazing. It was amazing feeling that day. Dude, you know what, too? And, and one of the things that I see so often, even in my oldest kiddo was 19 or 20, I'm sorry. And watching her, she was a basketball player and watching her grow up and come up through the city league and some select and little club teams and stuff. It was amazing to me, the dad's, that it was all about performance-based love. If their kids played good on the field, it was, I love you, I'm proud of you. But, man, I saw dads walk away from the court after the game because their kid played bad. And one of the things I always remembered from a very early, early on as a father is, man, I was going to love my kid and tell them I'm proud of them no matter how well they played on the football field or the basketball court or whatever because – you know, for me now, did we have some great conversations? Hey, man, that was a tough game, wasn't it? <laughs> you know, and, and I'd give her a little feedback and whatever. But I said, look, I'm proud of you. You stuck in there. You're going to have some bad games, right? You're going to have some good games. But it's, it's so much of that performance-based love. And I'm sure you saw that throughout your career. It's like the dad, the damage that's done when a child thinks that they only can get love from a dad by how well they play on the football field. It's, it's, that's the part I think most fathers take, doesn't understand the damage that can do. And my dad, I don't even know, I could have had a worse, horrible games. I would never know because my dad treated every game like it was, like it was winning. And there are times where, what, did we win? And he's like, no, you didn't win. I said, you, I said, what were you thinking? You could have broke a tackle. Like, my dad wasn't like that. My dad was like, good job, you know, get him that next week. And I never knew if I had a bad game or not. I think parents, especially fathers, are putting so much competition and so much, you know, ability to perform more than out, you know, out their own expectations that it's making kids fold more than they can get, bring that confidence up. And I think that's what fathers need to really start learning. Let them build that confidence level. So when you ready for them to say, Hey, this is where you messed up a little bit. They can take that criticism and really hone it rather than trying to push you away and push the sport away. You know, too, I was at dinner not long ago with another father, and we were talking, and he was talking about how even social media, he thinks, has even polarized that more because guys and, and, and moms, too, they want to be able to do a picture with little Johnny because he won this, that, or the other, or because, well, you know what I mean? They, and they want to show, there's a couple of things. They want to show how great their kid is, but they want to show also how, to great, how great of a parent they are. And so... It's all about, I think that's built in psychologically even more into some of these parents' heads because they're beating and, and really wanting their kids to succeed even more so they can pay, take a picture on social media. It drives me crazy. <laughs> Man, everything is now social media based. So if your kid ain't winning, 
he's losing. So I think we need to really start pulling back of what we are expecting our children to be for the sake of entertainment for others who really don't care because that's how you're getting a lot of that social media energy that you don't need in your household. You don't want to start using that as the benchmark of what everybody else is doing or what everybody else's kid is doing because I'm telling you, you're going to drive kids into the ground and you're going to put them in a hole where they're not going to escape it when they become into their adolescent years. So, dude, tell me, i got to ask you, what was it like to play for Paterno? It was amazing. I mean, it was like it was about as old school as it's going to get. Like old school, you know, Italian, Brooklyn. Like you get pearls of wisdom. You know, you get a lot of things that you never thought Joe was about. And it would be times where he would say things that were really, really funny, but it was really, really, I would say, like, gangsterish. Like, you know, he, <laughs> when at one time, uh, we lost to an overtime in Iowa, and the referee goes off the field. And he's chasing the referee all the way into the tunnel, telling him, you blew that call, blew that call. And he goes in the squad meeting the next day. And he said, man, he said, if that referee was back in Brooklyn, he would be bleed from here to here. And we all looked at each other and died laughing, but it was just such a funny Thing because you know we looked at coach as 75 76 years old man drove a, a sob literally almost half more, more than half my career and you just saw how humble he was and made sure everything was done the old school way and the right way and that's it was such a great respect to watch you know him win these you know break these records and become the coach he became i was gonna say so just you know looking in from the outside you think like it was easy to play for. Was he hard to play for? It, it was hard. I, I remember seeing you getting, you, you'd see him get riled up, chase a ref down the field or whatever. But was he, was he pretty easy to play for? Or was he a hard ass kind of, you know, expectation level was a certain or, or, you know, could never be good enough? I mean, give me a little insight. What was it like? He was, he was definitely great to play for. It was easy to play for. Uh, his rules were rules of what men should be. He'd be like, if, you, if you're on a time, you're 15 minutes late. He made sure at squad meetings, if the squad meeting was at 8 a.m., you had to be there at 70, 745. 746, you're late. And he would make sure you knew it. We couldn't have goatee. You couldn't have braids. You couldn't have dress. And he made sure that we were clean cut because he knew going into the world, people were going to look at us with a perspective of if you want to be a man or not, if you want to answer the bell, if you're going to – come dressed, prepared to work. And that's how he got into it. He, he could care less about the football part of it. He was more and he was more involved in the aspect of making sure we were going to be men outside of Penn State. I think that's how he treated us. And that's how most of us took to it, took to his rules and made sure he prepared us to be men. Now, you have a daughter, right? Yes. yes. Okay. Any other kids? No, just her. Okay. How did your dad influence you as a father? By just being there. My dad did everything possible. Even the times where I was arrested and I was getting more getting in trouble in my 20s and 30s, I tried so hard to push my family away and push my father away for me to do it on my own, to get me out of my own troubles on my own. And every time when I was bailed out, I was thinking, I don't want to call a cab. I'll have one. My girlfriends picked me up. It was my dad right there. And this is the point where we're, I'm in the news for it. And he's in the news for it because of me. So it's like you would think that he would just throw me away. But my dad has always been there for me every single time. And I think by doing that and having a child of my own, I wanted to make sure that I'm, I'm for my child. I'm with my child every step of the way, regardless of what she does. And make sure that I give her the love and support that she needs. And I think that's what... I commend my father for is always being there when I had trouble because he understood the pressure I was going through. He understood why I didn't view this world the same way as I viewed it with him. And that's how he took all my troubles and the things that happened because he knew that no one's going to be like my father. And I, that's how I have with my daughter. I want to make sure that any man in our life is not going to be like me. So you got to be prepared for the ins and outs of, you know, relationships or just dealing with this world in general. Dude, isn't it, you know, it's funny. God's got such a crazy sense of humor uh, to give a guy like you a daughter, you know, and, and all the things that you've been through. And like me too, I got three daughters, bro. <laughs> <laughs> wow. and we really got to talk about what you've been doing. <laughs> yeah. That's why I ain't got no hair. <laughs> Dude, it is, it is, 
I've been blessed in a tremendous way, but I'll tell you what, girls, wow, it is a, it's interesting. You know, it's, it's, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a heck of a journey. I've learned a ton about myself as a man and they've taught me probably more than I'll ever teach them. But, but, you know, in the sense, back to your story about your dad, because I think this is such a powerful piece in the times that you strayed and messed up, made mistakes, did whatever, you knew, you always knew your dad was going to be there, huh? Always. And even when I, in the back of my mind, you, you heard, I heard my father's voice every time I got in trouble. I was like, oh, I, it wasn't the papers, ESPN, you know, the person I was with or her friends or the parents. It was my dad's voice in the back of my head because what am I going to tell my father? And that was from all the way from grade school, all the way to my, my life now, it was always in the back of my head, what is my father gonna think? What is my father gonna say? And that's how now I gotta stay out of these little troubles and all that because now that voice has reached me when I'm about to be 40, that voice is, that is my voice now. My voice is, what's my father gonna think? What's my father gonna say? And now it's, what is God gonna think? What's my earth, what's my, my spiritual, my heavenly father gonna think? And I think you combine those two, you really get a perspective on the decisions you make in this life and know that now they're going to be permanent decisions, whatever they, whatever decisions you're going to make now. And I think that's the, the greatest power of dads and knowing God and knowing my father is having men that have give you that subconscious in your head, like, oh, you better, you better not. And so that's how I live, start to live my life. You know, I think the, the, the idea and, and I think a lot of dads need to hear this. They maybe their kids have lost their way, and they they're playing out that prodigal son or prodigal prodigal daughter story. But to know how important it is for a dad to continue to pursue them, and, and for them to know how important it is for them to let their kids know, man, I love you no matter what, no matter what mistakes, no matter how you screw things up, whatever, I'm still gonna love you. So. There's so much truth in that because eventually you knew with all everything you were doing, mistakes make whatever, that your dad was always going to be there, right? Always, always. Because like I said, like the times where I would try as hard as I could to push my whole family away, especially my dad, because I didn't want to hear that voice. I didn't want to hear that voice for reason. I didn't want to be accountable at times, but I knew I was gonna get that phone call. I, regardless of what it was, I knew I was gonna get that phone call, I knew I was gonna get that text. And even when I turned my phone off, show up at the door. I was like, so it's like, I couldn't, the more as I try to run, as more I was bringing up to me. So it's, uh, it's like I said, I, I really wish everybody could, ex could have those type of dads and examples, because you really, really, no matter how painful it is, it's just, you losing that childish behavior that you had, that rebelliousness, and stepping into being a man, stepping into being responsible, and understanding the choices you make from then on are gonna be permanent ones. You no longer gonna have people bail you out and get you out of trouble. So I think that's what ultimately all dads were preparing young men for. So dude, let's get into your story about the prodigal son, because I, I, I just, I'm a prodigal son. There's many of us out there that we lost our way. And I mean, I had a 30 year journey where I was just doing stuff. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about, uh, give me some background as far as like leading up to that moment where you came back to God and, uh, and how, you know, that's now translated into your life that you live now. My, my problems have always been with, with women. I was very shy growing up and I was always a shy guy. I was more of a, I'll make you a mixtape, you know, I'll write you some love letters, but as far as far, I can handle emotion. And playing football, I got more out of football because people respected and feared me as football, and I could lose myself. And more as I got older, I was losing myself to an aggressive personality and stopped being soft, gentle, shy that I was going, when I was getting into it. So people started respecting me, loved me more for being overly aggressive. So when I would have relationships with women and you had money, uh, I started to use or started to develop those same type of techniques that made me loved and feared on the football field. I introduced them into my relationships. So I'd be overly aggressive. I would yell, scream, push, hold, grab. I, I, would, I would do it all to, to show intimidation to get my way. 
So I would beat my chest, do whatever I want, throw things in the room. And those things were getting me in trouble, but it wasn't getting me in enough trouble where I didn't know when to stop. And I think that's the most dangerous man to really involve yourself with, if we're talking to ladies too, is to somebody who knows what they're doing, but knows when to stop. So growing and getting into these situations, and it would always be my attachment of my heart to women when I'm, when I'm not feeling I'm man enough, I would attach myself to women who didn't have fathers, who didn't have uh, authority figures in their life. And that was who I, I gravitated to because then I could show dominance to these women and make them do what I want when my life outside of that wasn't going well. And I started to, that was my personality. And then when I started learning to drink, drinking was my, it's my way to cancel out bad games, cancel out bad situations. So I would drink more. And then when you find you develop a talent that you can actually out drink people, it became part, that became part of your personality. So now I'm big, bad Larry, can break up 50, 60 tackles a game, and I can drink a whole bottle of tequila by myself and still walk away. And then with those situations when you, you add women who test you when you're drunk or test you with it, you, you go above and beyond. You, and I was a man of extremes. It was never you caught me in the middle. You caught me either I'm very, very calm or you caught me when I'm very, very angry you see in rage. And then that was become my personality. And you add a spiritual factor in it. It was I was the, always demonically charged up. I was feeling myself like a chalice with demons. And no matter what I did or how I did it, those things will come to the surface. So it wouldn't even be something I was mad at you for then. It would be something that happened to me in fifth grade that would come up in my brain. For some odd reason, and that what I would use for my rage. And I used that as a tool for football film, but now I'm using it as a tool to develop my relationships with women. So I would get arrested a lot. And every time I would get arrested, it would be I was drunk. It would be me and the girl at 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning. And it would always be, okay, well, we both forgive each other, case dismissed, and those situations would happen. And then uh, when I stopped playing football, I was just a breath. I, was, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Football has been my life joy and been my therapy. And even when I had my child, you know, she was one at the time, I still couldn't know what I wanted to do after football. And trying to raise a child, when you're not right to raise a child, it's going to, it's going to come out. I was still partying. And at the time in Miami, you know, the ecstasy MDMA drug scene came on, and then I was more into house music, guys. Don't ask me why. Uh, so I was taking pills almost every other night to numb myself because I didn't want to realize that football was over. I didn't want to realize that I had to go get a job. I had to provide for my family. And I was just literally living off, you know, my child's mother. I didn't know what they wanted to do. I was saving some of the money, but most of the money, it, it went to private jets. It was living like an NFL football player and not thinking it's going to come to a head. Um, and then, so when I got myself right, I actually had my parents had to come bring me home a couple of times. It would be stories where people who knew my brother would call my brother, like, yo, your brother's down here with pills falling out of his pocket. And it would be those nights where they had to check on me. Hey, where you doing? Where you at? And it was, I was so reckless as a child, uh, as, a, as a grown man, really in my late 20s, not my 30s, I had to be out. I did not want to go to sleep. I was, a, I was a demon living in a demon's world. I was up to what, six, seven o'clock in the morning, sleep all day, go back out at night, sleep all day, Bug out at night, have chest pains because I'm doing too way too many drugs. I'm like, I don't want to be here. And you feel like you don't want to be alive because you don't have life. So I let a couple of relationships go by. I started getting a little bit better at that. Uh, I didn't really meet my answer to God. I meet my spiritual reckoning. Uh, well, I'd say the, the road of Damascus. I really didn't have that moment until literally seven or eight months ago. Uh, I was, you know, dating girls, really trying to get used to not being only aggressive. My daughter has taught me so much. She's been so gentle with me and I'm gentle with her. So she now sees what I'm doing because she's of age. And so I couldn't find an answer because I kept putting all my eggs to other women or other people who, to build me up. So I just dropped to my knees eight, nine months ago. I was like, I'm here. I'm, I'm, I surrender. I give up. I can't do this by myself. Like, tell me what you want me to do. And it was since then, God has really, all right, 
you're gonna watch this. So I would just stumble across YouTube videos about heritage, about uh, what God did to Job, or what they, I just started seeing so much imagery and really digesting it in and unlearning a lot of bad habits that I had always already picked up. And my belief system was off. I wasn't into God, but I was into the universe. So I was really coming out of this satanic matrix that I was in. It really felt new. I felt like Neo. I felt like, wow, okay. And more and more I prayed, more and more he showed me more. And so it became a thing where, wow, like I really removed myself. And God really set me outside of this world and said, all right, now look at everything that you've been doing and doing and look what, where you're at now and look how better you feel for it. And I was ever since then, I've been feeling amazing. I, I, I really can't express it, but it's amazing to watch things and watch the things I would usually get mad at. Like, I'm not mad at it. I'm giving people advice. It'd be times when I'm out knowing I'm not supposed to be in certain clubs and all that, but I would remove myself. But I would see people like drunk or sick, and I'd be like, oh, I'd be rushing to them and like, you want water? You need water? You need anything? Back in those days, I'd be like, yo, you want a shot? You, you want to drink some more? That, so it's just an amazing transformation with God giving me a child, even if it's, it's a sin to have a child in a wedlock, but to, he, he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. So to have a child and calm me down enough where I can raise that child, find God, and be able to give thanks to him but as being being found. Dude, it, isn't it funny too? Cause like I look and I live some of that life, probably not to the quite to the, to the extent that you did. Um, but I can spot dudes that are were just like me at a younger age. Like I, I I and within like a minute or two, I know the struggles and things they're going through because I lived it. And like whether it's a personality, the way they're acting, the drinking, the crit, whatever. But it's crazy because I can spot those guys that I have this compassion for them, right? You have this grace because it's like, man, that dude's struggling with something, and I get it. And you can see it. Like, you see it on their faces, and you can tell almost what stage they're actually at. You can tell by looking at them like, man, he's just two more months, he's going to make it through. Like, three more months, he's going to make it through. And sometimes, guys, for guys like us, we need to hit rock bottom three or four times just to know we hit rock bottom. And then that's when you, from there you go up. I think you, I mean, you could definitely testify to that as, as especially being strong and hard headed, we need to really hit that rock bottom two or three more times. To let us know that you, we, how long you know, the guy's like, how long you going to play down here? Like, I'm really ready to bring you up, but you have to let go of some of those, that ego. And that's what God's doing. He put me through a test of releasing all that ego. To, for me to be who I am now. You know what, dude? And I could tell, too, the humility. And, and I say this all the time, people I deal with. And the true trans transformation and what God does in a person's life, you see a humility. Because they realize, man, I can't make it another stinking day without God. You know what I mean? I could be off at the bar and lose my family and marriage and whatever if I'm not careful. I need God every day. And if I don't have him, I will screw this thing up, I can guarantee you. <laughs> so back to, because I love this part, and I think it speaks to so many men, the identity piece. Because you as a stud professional, I mean, stud college football player, stud NFL football player, all the accolades, all the fame, fortune, all of that, to walk away from that, and that's been your identity for so long. And, and I see this, you kind of see it in, in a bunch of professional athletes that, that end up getting out of the game and it just become, they become a train wreck, right? Because that was their identity and they don't have that anymore. What was that like for you and how did that play out in your life? Uh, it was literally when I was trying to find what I was going to do to make money because I had broken up with my, my child's mother. So I'm like, I have to be able to supply and support this child. And I cannot be, I, I'm dead, being a deadbeat dad didn't run in my family for generations. Not my father, my father's father. It, it just didn't happen in our bloodline. So I had to make something happen. And I'm telling you, it's funny because God sends you down roads where he knows it's going to break you. And I was quiet, but I was prideful. And I was like, I'm not doing that. You know, even when I played football, I was like, I'm not playing special teams. I'm a starter. I'm not doing this. So it came to a point where I was taking in odd jobs. 
I, God had me to break my will and break my ego. And I'm telling you, this is, I, I don't tell the story that's this, this, this often. I took an uh, interview for one of these uh, people that sell, they say that you can, it's a pyramid scheme. So I went in for the job, like, oh, we can, we'll hire you right on the spot. I was like, what, really? I was excited, I called my mom, she was excited. So I'm thinking it's gonna be everything, I'm like, this is gonna be smooth. Turns out I was selling boosted makeup in a three-piece suit in 90 degree heat in the summer in Miami on South Beach. And I am not a salesman. If anybody knows me, I don't talk about nothing. I don't speak. When I speak, it's not, it's not about selling anything to somebody. And I literally worked that job for, I would say, four to five days. I worked selling makeup, women's makeup on South Beach, near the beach where everybody could see me in a three-piece suit. And I did that for like from, from eight to three o'clock in the afternoon, I came back. That broke me. That from then, that broke me. I literally, I was like, all right, I'm done. I, I'm, I, this is not who I am. Like, I, I'm done. I, but God's like, okay, I'll give you another test. I'll put you back to school for a little bit. So I went and did the MBA program in Miami. And then I figured out that my learning was off. I wasn't able to pay attention. And, you know, the whole thing with CTE and, and the, the gender effects of football and helmet hitting and all that. That was starting to take its toll. So then I was able to link up with the guy who did nonprofit work. He was willing to pay me to be a nonprofit. So I then had a job helping out kids, doing radio interviews. And that was, I think that was when everything that was coming against me, I was like, no, this is for a reason. This, like, God's giving me everything I had lost. He's giving it back to me, but he's doing it his way. And I lost my ego, was helping back helping kids. And from then, I literally had never had a word about a bill, a, a money, or anything in my life. And I started giving back more because I understood that God breaks you down so he can build you up and give you everything the devil took away from you. And I think, fathers, it don't matter if you're an NFL athlete, $5 million, $6 million, or you at a job and you're a CEO, if you really want to commit yourself to God and you want to be built up and protected, you got to be able to get rid of the stuff that the devil worshipped you for. And that is, I think, that is like the biggest thing that I've learned during this walk. Yeah, and just knowing that being able to, to come to terms with my identity isn't in an NFL former Penn State running back, all that stuff. My identity is in Christ, right? My identity is in what God calls me, and he calls me a beloved son, right? When you get that... When you really believe and understand that, man, we're all messed up, we're all jacked up and flawed and whatever, but we are a beloved son of God, a beloved child of God, and he loves us no matter what mistakes we've made, no matter where we've been, what we've done, all that stuff. His grace is new every day, right? Man, when, when guys get that, that's a huge thing. And, and, and like you said, even the humility, because God's got a way of hu humble. <laughs> <laughs> Humbling us. <laughs> matter of fact, I couldn't even get out of your mouth. <laughs> I couldn't. I got a buddy of mine. He called me not long ago. He goes, dude, I got to stop praying for humility. <laughs> he said, God is like showing me some big time humble pie, you know? So, yeah. And so, dude, I love the story, man. And, and now is something, did you, were you raised in church, you said? Yeah, I was raised in church, but, you know, as a kid, you really don't take in the Bible. You're not reading the Bible. I'm watching NFL films with Steve Sable. That was my church. Like, football came on. I'm there, front and center. I'm, I'm doing the moves. But then it came to church. It, it, we, I just, my brain just couldn't accept it yet because I wasn't mature enough to understand the spiritual. But it was a base. But it was always there. It was always, when I, even when I was acting up, it was always I would pray. If God wouldn't hear me, I would still pray. And I knew that at the time I wasn't living right, I wasn't being it right, but I knew my heart was into doing the right things. And I think that's why God shows that he is long-suffering and full of grace because he worked with me knowing I was breaking laws and commandments and sinning, that he was giving me a little bit to survive to get me to a point where he could take it all away from me and build me up when I was ready and mature to be built up. And I think that's, like I said, it's, like you said, like we're, we're his children, you know, and he treats us as, as children. You know, the thing, and I think for most dads to hear is, and what I was kind of getting at was just, there was that foundation. You knew, right? And the importance of us taking our kids to church, because 
they understand and see that God is a priority in our life, you know? And so for you having at least that foundation, knowing, man, there, there's a God, there's something going on there. You, and I was the same way, dude. I was running as hard as I could the opposite way of God. Because I didn't want to face the monster in the mirror I created. All my junk, the shame, guilt, unworthiness, all that mess, right? But, but I knew something was up. And deep down, I kept playing and doing this stupid stuff. But I knew my behavior was linked to something. I knew there was a God. And so ultimately, it's like you. It's like, okay, Lord, <laughs> I surrender. For, you know, I'm all in. Now, tell me from a father perspective, man, What's been your biggest struggle and how did you overcome it? I think my biggest struggle was, was the, the anger part of it. Like once you, once you leave the game of football, that anger comes with you and it's always going to be with you because that's who your personality attributed all your success to. And that's who I was. And when you get a, a daughter and you yell and scream and you see her shiver away when, you know, when she's little and then you starting to see things as as a woman would see or as a grown woman would see or how you would want your child to view you being a young woman. And so you knew you have to be the example. You are the set example for your daughter to latch on to you so she'll face every man in her life from you. And I think I didn't want to show her that I was a yeller, a screamer, a spanker. I did not want to show her those things. So it really, and that's how I grew up. Most I was young, being a younger boy, we got spanked. I did, did things, I got spanked for it. And I think having a daughter, you don't want to raise your child that way because it, do, it does bring out certain attributes that shouldn't just go with young ladies. It just, it just shouldn't. So that was my hardest thing was to make sure I was gentle, patient, and calm with her when discussing things she's doing wrong. Because I want her to be able to open up a facet of communication to speak to me about everything. I don't care if it's boys, I don't care if the kid's picking on her, I don't care what color she likes. I need her to be comfortable and not look at me as a monster and look at me as a friend and a father. And I think that's how I kind of, I respected my father for, but I was, I was a little bit afraid. My father's the only man I'm really afraid of. Because my dad is big, so it, it, he was the only man I was afraid of. So I, a lot of things I hid from him because I was so scared of getting in trouble, so scared of letting them down, and I don't want to do that with my daughter. I don't want to make her feel that she's ever scared to come to me thinking that she let me down, that I won't love her after, after if she's let me down, that's something wrong. I want to let her know it's okay. I can work with her because I want to relate always. I keep telling my daughter, I said, Jalen, everything you do, I've done already. Like, I did the same thing with my father, you might do the same thing for me. So you might as well just start telling me everything so we can work through this together. <clears throat> you know what, too, man? I, one of the things I've learned as a dad and, and, and is sharing some of my own struggles and issues with my daughters. Uh, my two older ones know more than my younger one, and it's kind of that age-appropriate, you know, thing. But my two oldest know the battles with depression and alcoholism and everything that I've gone through. And it's, it's in those struggles. I think they see, you know what, man, dad's imperfect. Dad's made mistakes and, you know, continue will probably make more mistakes, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's okay. And that he still loves me no matter what. And so it, it builds, for me, it's built an intimacy with my girls when I've shared just these real honest struggles that I've had that then they see and it kind of you know that wall comes down for them too and then it opens up that communication where they know and understand they can come to me and ha and share their stuff you know so it, that's dude I what's funny is I'm, as I'm listening to you talk with your daughter if you're like me I'm going I'm looking out for the little punk that was like me and I don't want her dating him <laughs> <laughs> exactly what, what age did they start really understanding your story when you were talking to them you know what? So my youngest one is 13 and it was probably about then I started sharing more and more and, and I've started to share more and more with my 13 year old, but it was really in that teenage years where I started sharing about some of my own struggles in those conversations where you're talking, start talking about alcohol, the temptation that's going to come because they got friends that are going to be drinking, you know, all that type of stuff. So um, in those teenage years, I think is, is, you know, and it's probably different, a little different because the variables with a, with a kiddo that, 
you know, maybe a little bit more mature than another one. And there's so many different variables there, but just as you feel, you know, like she'll get it, she'll understand, just being able to share some of the stories. And here's the key, man. I think every child and even every adult has this innate curiosity to know more about their dad. Like your daughter wants to know what was it like when my dad grew up? Who was his best friend? What was his favorite candy? What, what was his favorite ice cream? They want to know those things, man, because that brings you closer to them. There's a bond there, right? I remember one night I sat down, laid down with my girls, and they were probably, I'm going to say like 12, 10, and 3 or something. And we're talking, and they said, hey, Dad, what was your first job? And I had, my first job was Chuck E. Cheese. I had to dress up in a rat costume. <laughs> <laughs> and walk around in this hot rat costume kids were pulling my tail and i'm like the big old head i can't even see <laughs> it was a nightmare but and so i mean it's like two hours later and i'm still sharing stories dude and they were like just consumed and it that's when it hit me on many levels like our kids want to know man they want to know what our dads were like what our moms were like they want to know more of how it is we grew up you know and it also helps them connect the dots to see oh okay i get it i get why dad is the way he is or why he does this or why he does this so on many levels man it's it's a good thing it's a good hold your daughter she's not it okay yeah so i take her i take her uh when i started doing uh like kind of speaking engagements and speaking about my life story and how i turned around i bring her with me and even though she's she's drawing it the whole time, I, but it's in her brain. She knows. I keep telling her. I keep reminding her. It's like you know, I wasn't perfect. You know, I was really bad until you came. But because of you, I really changed. I always kind of put that in her head, so she'll feel like you know she can actually come to me. Like if I did this, like she'll be like she called me Poppy. She's like, I, I, she Poppy did this too, so I might as well go tell him I did it because I know he did it. So it, it it makes her comfortable to let her know that I wasn't you know a Superman all my life. Dude, and that's what it's honestly all about, dude, for your kids to have that. And, and man, for you, honestly, and, and even a nine-year-old, the maturity level of them sometimes, it's just, you know, you, bro, you got to pray through it. And, and just as God opens the door in those conversations, whether it's laying down at night or picking up from school and, you know, just things start happening. Here's what I'll tell you, what I've learned as a dad of daughters, especially when they become teenagers, is listening and how important it is just to listen. A lot of times they come, and I, I didn't learn this from my wife years ago, it took me forever, is uh, she'd come to me with something. And I, a guy, we're fixers, right? It's like, okay, do this, 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 and this. Boom, I'm out of here. I, I just won the day. Instead, she just wanted me to listen. She didn't want the problem to be fixed. She just wanted me to listen. And it's the same way with my girls, with my teenagers now, college kids, when they come home, man, when they come in my office, I drop everything. Because it's not that often that they want to hang out and chat because they're so busy and got so much going on. So when I get that opportunity to chill with them, man, I'm all in. And so that's, dude, that's really helped me from a father of daughter standpoint. Okay, dude, as we start to wrap up, a couple of last questions. What do you think has been your greatest achievement as a father? Uh, I think my greatest achievement is actually just my only, you know, affectionate ways with her. Like it's, I've been able to have so much fun. Like now she's my travel buddy. We go to Jamaica. It, it seems odd outside looking in because like, why you just can't find a girl to go with her? I'm taking my daughter like to Jamaica. We go to Bahamas. Like I take my daughter everywhere. She's literally my like my best friend. And I, it's like I can't believe my biggest achievement. Is, I can't believe I'm really having a, a grown child after how I was and how I was raised and. And being all aggressive and wild, to think that I have calmed down so much that is to have her with me, talk to her, you know, open up with her. And I was a very sheltered person. I didn't talk about any of my personal struggles. And talking about with my child and just sharing the same things that she likes. And it's just, that's like my biggest accomplishment is just being there for my child and not stepping away. And sometimes I feel, I really feel bad for children who lose their fathers either to jail or death or they're just walking away. It's like, it, it really eats me up because I, because it's so much love and support that you could just show them by just being there. 
you could, you could be bad, you could be worse, but just you trying and being there, they pick up on that and they know and understand that. So it's, I think my biggest achievement is just not backing down. And I've been through it. Like, I, like trust me, I, I want guys to know that, like, you know, when you bring up with your child's mother, just be prepared to, to be in court. Like, go through it because it's just, it's just the way it is. You're just dealing with women who are emotional and they got to take it out on you. So I was never been a person that, no, nah, right, fine, you can have the child, I'll do my own thing. I was never that guy. I'm just so glad that I was able to fight for my daughter every step of the way, no matter how many days I can have her or nothing. It, it, I was fighting all the way with her, and I just now finally got the day, gotten the same equal share of rights that I've gotten. And I'm telling you, she's been born 2010, so it took me nine years of fighting. Uh, it took a lot of money. <laughs> But it, it really did pay off. And I think that's my biggest attribute and I'm really proud of is the fact that I never gave up on her. Dude, and I'll tell you what, just the importance of that fatherly affection because it's so important and so many young girls don't get that. And the ones that don't get it, they need a father love. They need a love and, a, and affirmation and everything from a dad. If they don't go get it, I mean, if they don't get it, from you, they're going to go find it somewhere. And most times it's going to be with a knucklehead, right? It's going to be with some dude they don't need to be getting it from. So that's, that's huge, dude. If you're sitting in front of a new dad and, and he says, hey, Larry, tell me, what's the one most valuable piece of advice you'd give me? What would you tell him? I would say be relative. Like a lot of dads go into raising their kids with the expectation of, I can't be like my father. I want to be like my father. Be the dad that you were meant to be. Use your life expect, use your life stories, your situation that you learned. Be that dad. Don't try to outgrow, do your dad, or if he was a bad father, don't say, I'm never going to be that guy. Just don't. Just be you. Be the dad that you were supposed to be through your life, ex life experiences and use those experiences to teach and raise your child and the things that you didn't get to see and things you did get to see Share those experiences. Let you always let your child know that you were once five, you were once seven, 15, 20. Let them know at the stage in their life there that they're gonna do the same things you're gonna do anyway. Do not hide those things because the being related related relative to you to your child's life struggles, you've got to understand that that is how the bond grows tighter. Because if the kids look at you like you're a superman, they idolize you. Don't let them break that out by finding out you did something they did and you didn't tell them. That is how most fathers get caught and, and children be like, well, I can't trust you anymore because you weren't real with me. Be real with your children. Even if it hurts, be real with them because it'll take a lot of taboo off of what they did. So when they think they want to have that first sip of beer, tell them you already drunk five, eight beers by that age anyway. And they don't knock every like, Well, it ain't cool now to do it. So now be that real with them and then they will really love and appreciate you more and start talking to you about experiences they are about to have rather than having the troubles that they have when they try to keep it from you. So that, I think that would be my, my number one thing. Dude, I love it. And, and you know, it's like we can't pretend that we're perfect because they're going to find out we ain't. <laughs> right. eventually they're gonna find out that we're not perfect so i love it dude i appreciate you man again thanks for taking this time and, and i i think i'd love to have you back on at some point too i'd love to talk more about the cte and and some of the other stuff dude you got such a great story and again bro i am man your story of the prodigal son and god you coming back to god after everything you, you've been through, man, it's got the power to give so many men hope because there's so many guys that are out there that are in that place that think they could never come back. You know what I mean? That think they're too far gone. And so I just encourage you, just keep sharing your story, man. Let people know there's hope and that there's a God that's full of grace and love. And man, he loves us no matter what. Exactly. And I think a lot of people, a lot of kids, if you want... If you're a new Bible reader and you don't really know Bible stories and where to start to begin, learn about King Solomon and how he strayed and came back. Learn if you want, if you think that you stole or you murdered and all that, look up Manasseh. Look up Manasseh when he was king, when he saw Isaiah in two. And then he did all he did against God and still went down on his knees, prayed, and God welcomed him back. 
I'm telling you, people, I don't tell these stories nothing about it. They just think everything you have to be perfect. But stories are in there that show guys who are very, very wicked, very, very murderous, and they got on their knees and came back to God and God heard them. So do not think that you, you have to run from your troubles. God will hear you and God is watching you run. Just come on back.